Trouble at Reading Railroad. Those aren't the rules, said Mario. This is my house. I'll tell you what the rules are, says, said Nicky. The two cousins st stared at each other, both refusing to blink. They were warriors about to leap at each other's throats and settle their argument with violence. The battlefield lay between them, their armies thrown across. It was not an ordinary battlefield covered with tanks and cannons and soldiers. It was a square covered in colorful rectangles, some guarded by green and red plastic fortresses. But although the war wasn't real, the fight between Nicky and Mario was. They were playing Monopoly and prepared to do anything to win. It had started that afternoon when Mario's mom dropped him off at Nicky's house. They were cousins nearly the same age and had been playing together since they were born. They had played pirates and action figures, video games and tag, and had always had a good time. But whenever they had made the mistake of playing Monopoly, the same thing always happened. It always started with an argument over who got to be which piece. Obviously, both of them wanted to be the car. This is my house, Nikki would say. I get to be the car. You were the car last time. This is my house, Nikki would repeat, and not quite shouting yet. The shouting would come later. They would always argue about who would be the banker and who would be the realtor. Managing the properties was preferable, of course, because it involved less counting. Counting is never fun. I'm the realtor, Mario would say. No, Nikki would reply. I called it. My house. I called it, Mario would repeat, a little bit closer to shouting this time. Fine. And so the Monopoly war always started quietly, but it would get a little bit louder after each turn around the board. For the first few rolls, they were, there would be little conflict. Mario would buy Vermont Avenue, Nikki would buy St. Charles, but then one of them would get a property the other wanted. You can't buy Connecticut Avenue, Mar Mario would say. I need that one for my Monopoly. Well, I don't want you to get a Monopoly, Nikki would say, but I'll sell it to you. Okay, $10,000. There aren't even $10,000 in the game, Mario would say, very nearly shouting. Okay, how about 20000 No, No deal. No trades would ever be made. The game would st would stalemate and go on forever, unless one of them got a monopoly by sheer chance. Then the taunting would begin. Oh, wow, Mario would say. You have Baltic Avenue, Connecticut, and St. Charles. Those are really good properties. Oh, so what? So you've got all the yellows. Everyone knows the yellows are the worst. Who is Marvin Gardens, anyway? I don't know, but as soon as I get a hotel on him, it's going to cost you $1,200 to find out. Their voices got louder. Their sentences would get shorter. Their faces would get, red, uh, would get red as they counted out each move, slamming their pieces down with greater and greater fury. But they would not yell, no matter who landed on free parking, no matter how many hotels were built, no matter what monopoly, monopolies were acquired, they would not yell until one of them drew the card. Every time they landed on chance, the room would go quiet. They would lift the flimsy red card slowly, knowing it could be the match that lit the flame. And finally, as it always eventually did, the card had appeared. Take a ride on the Reading Railroad, Mario had read. If you pass go, collect $200. They both had looked at the board. Mario's piece, the hat, the stupid, boring, awful hat, had been the on the chance space two spots past Reading Railroad. If he went forward around the board, he would pass go, he would get $200. He would be able to afford the railroad, one of his favorite properties, and the game would shift in his favor. But he had known Nicky wouldn't let that happen. Nicky had picked up Mario's piece. Put that down, Mario had said. Nicky had then moved it back two rectangles and put it on rail Reading Railroad. You know it goes forward, Mario had said. You know it does. The car doesn't say anything about that. The pieces always go forward. Always. Only the cars that say advance. This doesn't say anything about it. So you take the most direct route. Th that means you go backwards. That means you don't get $200. My turn. Those aren't the rules. This is my house. I'll tell you what the rules are. Now they were shouting. Now Mario didn't care about reading Railroad anymore. Now all he wanted was to be right. Nikki stood up, sore from so many hours, sitting cross-legged. Give me the dice, he said. It's my turn. I move forward, I get $200.
give me the dice. Mario dropped the dice on the board, and Nikki bent down to pick them up. Mario bent down too, but he didn't reach for the dice. Without shouting at all, he slipped one finger under the board and flipped it as high as it would go. Money fluttered down from the ceiling like a very colorful snowstorm, as houses and hotels fell with all the clatter of plastic hail. Nikki opened his mouth like he wanted to scream, but no words came out. I don't think this game works with two people, Mario said softly. Nikki nodded. They cleaned up the game together, silently. Number 5. Part A. Select the sentence that best describes how the building of Bear Bear in Apple the Cat calls a meeting to order is similar to Nikki in Trouble at Reading Railroad. A. Bear Bear and Nikki are both built as the protagonist in their stories. B. Bear Bear and Nikki are both built as fantastical elements. C. Bear Bear and Nikki are both built to bring out a negative side of the main character. D. Bear Bear and Nikki are both built as the most interesting characters in their stories. Number 6. Part B. Select the detail from Trouble at Reading Railroad that's, that best supports your answer in Part A. Choose one answer. A. This is my house. I'll tell you what the rules are. B. Nikki stood up sore from so many hours sitting cross-legged. Give me the dice, he said. It's my turn. C. Mario dropped the dice on the board and Nikki bent down to pick them up. Mario bent down too, but he didn't reach for the dice. D. Without shouting at all, he slipped one finger under the board and flipped it as high as it would go. Number 7. The author used third-person narration in Trouble at Reading Railroad to provide the reader with information he or she could not know from dialogue alone. What order, what does the, that tell the reader about narration in Apple the Cat Calls a Meeting to Order? Choose two answers. A. The narration allows the reader to learn about multiple characters' actions. B. The narration allows the reader to learn about multiple characters' feelings. C. The narration allows the reader to know only Apple's actions, thoughts, and feelings. D. The narration allows the reader to, only, to know only Bear's actions, thoughts, and feelings. E. The narration allows the reader to learn why the girl is sleeping. Number 8. Read the paragraph. Mario dropped the dice on the board, and Nikki bent down to pick them up. Mario bent down too, but he didn't reach for the dice. Without shouting at all, he slipped one finger under the board and flipped it as high as he, it would go. Money fluttered down from the ceiling, like a very colorful snowstorm, as houses and hotels fell with all the clatter of plastic hail. What does the phrase, like a very colorful snowstorm, tell the reader about the setting? A. It would be impossible for the boys to restart the game. B. Nikki's parents would be mad about the mess. C. It was a stormy day and the weather matched the mood of the game. D. The game Monopoly was very expensive.